Hello folks and good evening. Today we are going to discuss something very interesting, uh, something I read re- very recently and it should be very relevant to the future of diabetes mellitus management and that is the relation between the endoplasmic reticulum stress and diabetes mellitus and it applies to both type 1 diabetes as well as type 2 diabetes. So let's endoplasmic reticulum. Now before we understand endoplasmic reticulum we need to first understand the structure of proteins. Right? So we all know that a protein has the primary structure, you have the secondary tr- structure, the tertiary structure and the quaternary structure. So the primary structure is basically the uh, sequence of amino acids. The secondary structure is when the Either you have the uh, alpha amyloid structure or you have the beta pleated sheet structure. And then you have the folding of these basic structure to form the tertiary structure. And then you have further folding and further, uh, you know, change, conformational changes which lead to the quaternary structure. Now, for a protein to really function, it should have a proper quaternary structure. So if it's folding its structure, everything is in a proper shape, then it is able to function and it is able to bind with its receptor and carry out whatever function it is supposed to carry out. So this is how a structure of a protein is really important, right? Now we know that uh, the proteins are formed by ribosomes, okay? But we also need to understand that it is not just important to form these proteins, but it is also important to have a proper quaternary structure of these proteins. So the proper quaternary structure of the protein is actually uh, ensured by the endoplasmic reticulum or the ER. Okay, so the endoplasmic reticulum basically functions to maintain the proper quaternary structure to form the proper quaternary structure of a protein. Now, why does this apply? Okay. And insulin is a very important protein in our body and insulin needs to have a proper quaternary structure to bind with its insulin receptor and to carry out the function which it is supposed to carry out. So this is the importance of endoplasmic reticulum and the endoplasmic reticulum structure. Okay, Now looking at the, uh, you know, how does this apply to disease state? Okay, So we will now think about and we will now discuss why why does this and what are the problems which arise in this process so whenever the protein is formed right and whenever the quaternary structure is formed as we discussed the endoplasmic reticulum is important for forming the proper quaternary structure but it also acts as a quality control it acts as a quality check or a qc for a proper quaternary structure so if a protein does not have a proper quaternary structure the protein gets rejected and if a protein has a proper quaternary structure, it gets accepted and it is released into the circulation, right? So the ER maintains the quality check of the protein, okay? So sometimes what happens is that uh, because of certain dysfunction, there is a lot of bad protein, proteins with bad structure start getting accumulated in the endoplasmic reticulum. So this produces a situation where you have a lot of accumulation of these Uh, poorly formed proteins this leads to a condition which is known as ER stress endoplasmic reticulum stress now you'll heard hear a lot about ER stress uh, in in endocrinology and you in fact continue to hear a lot about this in the future also so what happens is that when you have endoplasmic reticulum plasmic reticulum stress so if the cell is able to successfully reduce the endoplasmic reticulum stress then what happens is that it is able to successfully uh, mount a proper response to it and it is able to survive right but at some point of time the endoplasmic reticulum stress becomes so uh, excessive that the cell cannot survive and then its cell 
goes into a self destructive mode so it goes into a self destruction right so if the er stress becomes too excessive the cell goes into a state of self destruction so now coming back to how it applies to diabetes mellitus now the interesting thing is that the er stress is a kind of a unifying theory for both type 1 diabetes as well as type 2 diabetes okay so it it tends to become a sort of a unifying hypothesis for both like i said insulin is a protein and the structure of insulin is very important so the quaternary structure of the uh, insulin is very important interestingly insulin is also often malformed so about 20% of insulin formed every point of time is is not having a proper quaternary structure so this starts getting accumulated into the system leading to more uh, production of er uh, stress so increasing the er stress right now what happens in diabetes mellitus so let's first discuss type 1 diabetes and how uh, this er stress concept applies to type 1 diabetes okay so if you talk about type 1 diabetes we know that it's an autoimmune disease okay so basically there is increased auto cells there will be of course damage to the cells leading to uh, more malformed proteins and leading to increase of the er stress right so this ultimately the autoimmune destruction autoimmune insult on the beta cells often leads to increase of er stress and eventually this er stress uh, the body is not able to compensate and it goes into a auto destructive self destructive situation and it kind of tends to destroy itself leading to uh, the destruction of the beta cells so this is one of the mechanisms of type 1 diabetes the other thing is what happens in type 2 diabetes now why does the er stress occur in type 2 diabetes there are many theories for this in type 2 diabetes one of the theory is obviously very very common and that is insulin resistance right so you have increased insulin resistance and because of the increased insulin resistance there is increased insulin production and once you suppose you have a factory and you increase its production if the factory is anyways very much uh, you know uh, likely to produce uh, you know bad goods if you increase its workload it naturally produces more uh, you know problems so it produces more goods which are defective so in the same way when you have increased insulin resistance you have increased insulin production and this increased insulin production uh, obviously leads to increase of malformed insulin which increases the er stress right so this malformed insulin increases the er stress and ultimately initially there will be lot of insulin uh, beta cell dysfunction and eventually there will be beta cell destruction so this is what typically happens in type 2 diabetes so what you need to understand is that endoplasmic reticulum stress is important both for type 1 as well as type 2 diabetes however the mechanism by which er stress occurs in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes is little bit different right so this is one of the difference between type 1 but eventually there is increased er stress which leads to beta cell destruction or beta cell dysfunction right so this is the common pathway for both type 1 and type 2 diabetes now how do we apply this knowledge to clinical medicine so what are the clinical aspects of this that we need to understand now one thing you have to understand is that if there is some mechanism by which you can reduce the er stress or improve the body's response to er stress then you might be able to preserve the beta cells for a longer period of time and hence you can uh, prevent the progression of both type 1 as well as type 2 diabetes now unfortunately so far we have not been able to there are certain uh, you know uh, candidates for this imatinib uh, very interestingly which is a uh, anti cancer drug used in cml uh, is known to reduce er stress and perhaps this uh, you know of course there are no clinical trials for this so far just animal trials uh, in not mice is where it has been found to be useful however in future this is something which can be used and there is something known as tudca 
uh, I'll not tell you more details about it, but you can read up in the reference which is given below. Uh, this also is known to be a candidate to reduce ER stress and perhaps increase the longevity of the beta cells of the pancreas by reducing the endoplasmic reticulum stress. So these are some of the uh, clinical aspects. One very interesting clinical aspect uh, which I find and which is which is kind of a conclusive proof of uh, the presence of ER stress is a condition known as walcott relison syndrome. Now interestingly in this syndrome one of the components of this syndrome is diabetes mellitus right they have these children tend to develop diabetes mellitus. Now what is walcott relison syndrome this is basically a syndrome in which there is a protein known as PERC which is a kinase this kinase is missing and because of this missing kinase the body is not able to respond successfully. These children tend to develop diabetes apart from the other clinical features. So what this tells you that there is definite a link between diabetes and ER stress uh, which is very well evidenced and I think a lot of the times uh, you know we understand a disease better when you really uh, you know look at some autoimmune disease uh, sorry, some congenital disease or some enzyme deficiency which really links to that so I think in that sense this tends to uh, cement a bond between ER stress and diabetes mellitus so what I'm trying to just summarize here is that ER stress endoplasmic reticulum stress is an important player in the etiology of both type 1 and type 2 diabetes also it's an important player in the progressive beta cell dysfunction that happens at different rates of course very rapidly in type 1 and at a slower rate in type 2 diabetes but the beta cell destruction is linked with the ER stress and if we are able to stop the ER stress we will probably increase the beta cell longevity and uh, you know perhaps uh, might have a treatment aspect uh, in future. So thank you for listening to this and I hope to come up with more such interesting videos in this channel very soon.